I was talking to some friends last week, some really, really good people Stacy and I enjoy talking to from time to time, and they're in it. They're 100% in for Jesus. They love God. They live well. They seek him. They pursue their own growth in him, and, and they have some influence. They have, they have a growing influence in the world, and what they were sharing with us was new things have suddenly surfaced in their marriage that feel pretty big. What I was intrigued by was not just that story, but how common that story seems to be. And I'm not just referring to marriages, but good people, loving God, wanting more, finding themselves in some really hard circumstances. Friends, welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. Wanted to invite you into a conversation about that. Morgan and Alan in the studio here with me this week. Something is going on. I just want to start by asking you guys, do you know what I'm describing? Are you, what do you see happening recently in the lives of the people in your world, and and particularly in in the lovers of God? John, uh, I was spending some time with a mentor this fall. This guy, he's a sage. He's a modern day sage. And he's probably the most, I think it's fair to say, one of the most connected people in Christendom around the globe. That's, that's calling. That's his gifting. He's, he's decades into it in his 70s. He, he sees into lots of corners of the kingdom. And so I actually pulled him aside and I said, hey, I have a question for you. What do you see? What's going on? Because we, we pray a lot here, right? And say, God, what are you doing around the earth? And it was really interesting. His first, he smiled and he said, I see so much passion and so much hunger. And at first I was surprised, I wasn't prepared to hear that because to your question, I see many people in great battles. And then over the last several months, I've been putting those two ideas together that that's also true. That's what I'm seeing. I think Mm -hmm. what I want to say is I'm observing there is a deep hunger for God Hmm. and a deep passion in the hearts of the people that at least I encounter, they're wanting more. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be true around the globe. And at the same time, my observation is very much in alignment with what you shared of um, there, there are many people that are under great, you know, great battle and, and, and it feels heightened in, in, in a way. Doesn't it? I mean, I don't, I don't want to make this up, but I just, I, I could name a handful of stories right now of pretty solid people that are in pretty tough times. Yeah whether internally or relationally or financially or health. Yeah, encounters with several couples walking with God really well, and yet it in different ways, each of them is in a new season where it feels like they're being pushed into new ways of navigating things mm-hmm. where it, it's, an, it's not just another pass, but it's a deeper cut. And in isolation, I think it feels like for each of them, what are we doing wrong or why isn't this working mm-hmm. or what mm-hmm. what's changing? And so when you named that the other day, John, it was fascinating because it was like several puzzle pieces coming together in interpretation of, right, this isn't one couple or just Kelly and me yeah. or just any of us. Like something is changing, something's happening. Two weeks ago, chatting with some Folks who have been long time, long time disciples of Ransomed Heart, really solid people and love God, do a ton for God, suddenly find their business dropping out from underneath them. Financial floor is falling out. And every single person in the stories that I'm aware of, including our own personal stories, the tendency is to go first to what am I doing wrong? Mm-hmm. Right? Don't you see that? You know, yes. it, it, somehow we're blowing it. We're, what, did, what did we miss? What did we not do right that has led to this? Some sort of cell failure message seems to be how, how folks are interpreting this. Yeah, John, I really resonate with that. And another angle of it, I think, on a very personal level, I, I would offer by way of response is not only what am I doing wrong, but also when I do an honest inventory of soul, there's something in there that says, 
God really seems to be holding out on me. In other words, oh, God is good in general, but in specific, oh, yes. in a very personal way, there's some creeping in of simply doubting the particular goodness of his heart. And I think what I'd maybe say is a blurring of the lines between the utter goodness and care and provision of a loving, powerful father and kind of something this this not the best interest on my behalf. Oh gosh, yes. Absolutely. So friends, last fall we did a series, Morgan Stacy and I did a series called Hard Pressed. Hard pressed on every side. And in that we were making observations about, holy cow, the saints really mm-hmm. seem to be hard pressed these days. I want to reference that series because we're not going there here. There's some really helpful guidance, instruction. What do you do when you feel hard-pressed? In this podcast, I'm very curious about a phenomena that I think is going on that I, I think I have some interpretation for. What we're naming is people who love God, people are trying to live well, they're trying to love well, they're trying to parent well, they're trying to offer Jesus to their community where they can. None of them perfect, none of them, you know, but everybody's trying, and yet like hard things and new things mm-hmm. like these yeah. new revelations We're like whoa this you know chasms opened up in our marriage or a chasm just opened up in my kids or you know something really huge has just gone on in my business or okay so this is the phenomenon we're pointing to i think the first thing i want to say is how critical interpretation is how you interpret mm your current circumstances is really big, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, the the knee-jerk reactions of, you know, different people have different knee-jerk reactions, but often it's that collection of self-contempt. You know, I, I did something wrong. I brought this on myself, yeah. right? Or, Morgan, the, the deeper, subtler, really sinister interpretations against God yes. and against his heart, right? And, and ushering in doubt. If we can just name interpretation is critical. And oftentimes on this, you know, on this podcast and in, in our writings and teachings, we'll say, hey, heads up, you have an enemy. Be aware of that. But I don't think that's what's going on here. We talk a lot about warfare. Uh, if you listen to the podcast, we'll reference it. If you, you know, tap into our readings, blogs, events. But actually, gang, I don't think that's what's going on here. Of course, the enemy loves to throw gasoline on the fire, but warfare can often actually be a misinterpretation. Don't you think? What do you mean by that, John? It's just easier to go to, this is attack. You know, now that you have that toolbox and it's a very helpful toolbox, right? It's a super helpful toolbox and you can, you can shut a lot of things down and you can fix a lot of things and you can get a lot of breakthrough Mm -hmm. with that toolbox. If you're kind of a ransomed heart, you know, follower, it's, I think it's easy to just reach for that toolbox and say, this is warfare when we've had some relational issues with people over the last couple of years where clearly the issues were not warfare, but character issues and and issues of styles of relating and how they handle their world and, you know, their kind of collection of assumptions, but they just wanted to put everything on warfare. Right. It felt like that was almost a knee jerk reaction. Right. Well, even when warfare is involved, we have learned the question is what's the open door? Right. What's the access point? Why the warfare? Yes. Right. There's always something deeper at work. Yes. That that it's 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 rarely, if ever, only the yes. warfare. But I hear you saying we can we yeah. can just oversimplify to stay in a, a false sense of safety. Yeah. Yeah. On interpretation, Alan. How do, how do you see folks in your world? And I mean, you and Kelly have gone through some hard things this spring as a family as well. Like, what's the typical interpretive framework for us it was a need to reinterpret so much because we found ourselves with this unstated belief that a good life should be a relatively easy life when you're walking with god now i know mm-hmm. saying it here it sounds ridiculous and we didn't say that to each other in no those no words. no i'm i i'm in shock actually that's that's <laughs> that's not true 
<laughs> say it again, Alex. So, yeah, you're going to need to say yeah. that again because I think this I'm is pretty. Huge. I think I'm pretty committed to this one. Yeah, a good life does not equate to an easy life, nor maybe a better way to say it, a hard life isn't a bad life or an, a life to avoid. And so part of our rewiring of our own souls and interpretation was actually this feels like a season that is really hard and really good. And we have to hold that simultaneously. And it, it's hard because, boy, it's opposed. And, and God is doing a lot of construction on us. And that's hard. But it's good when we're walking through it with God and when we see what he's up to and when we see the effect on our life. And so that shift, John and Morgan, has helped us when hard things start to happen, not to go, oh, man, here we go again, or not this, and instead go, yep, we acknowledge this is hard. Now let's interpret it with God to get to the good instead of trying to run away from the hard or trying to patch it and just ignore it. And so that's been a huge part of the reinterpretation process for us. Hmm. Yeah, John, on the category of interpretation, I think one of the phrases that I would name that just feels like a pretty strong operating assumption is something like, man, well, it, it is what it is. Like the world's gone to hell and it is what it is. Like there, and we just went through an, you know, a pretty powerful podcast series on the world and and it's it's messy and there are some things that are unprecedented but but with it it seems as if there's some interpretation that often goes to well there's not much we can do about a lot of these things and though it's true we can't control all things there's some agreement in there i believe that has a sense of powerlessness mm -hmm. that has a sense of being a victim that has a sense of being weak when the truth is in the kingdom of god we have a stacked deck right and and ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun and so though we may be in unprecedented times in some ways the kingdom of god is 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 at hand god is still not changing, ever faithful and perfectly capable to equip us in this age. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to name, boy, that interpretation of, you know, the world's gone to hell in a handbasket. And and largely, we, we just have to settle for little victories here and there and now and then mm -hmm. is, is self-fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it comes with a lot of weariness. Right. I mean, after you faced, you know, just one crisis after another, you just get to a place where you're just tired yeah. and it's yeah. easy to go there and just say, hey, man, it is what it yeah. is. Right. Like it's whatever. Right. And then you look for a little relief. I think what I wanted to highlight it, as we get into this podcast today is an awful lot of people seem to be encountering some hard things new things in their lives or in their children's lives, right? Or in their ministry or in their business. And I think something is going on. I, I, I've been watching this for a while and, and I want to suggest that yes, while the enemy is, is no doubt taking advantage of it, I think that what I see, what I observe is God seems to be turning up the dial on maturity we know he's committed to our maturity, and we know that that's, a, that's an enormous part of our life here. Any parent knows this. You, know, you don't leave your three-year-old you know, in their narcissism. You, you, you want your three-year-old to grow up, and you know, as a parent, you shepherd them along the way. So I think at some point, everyone has some, you know, maturity is somewhere mm -hmm. on their bookshelf, mm -hmm. right? It's somewhere in their interpretive grid, but not not a super high priority. But rather than just naming this as, whoa, you know, it's, it's the hour that we live in, or whoa, the enemy really seems to be coming on strong, although those things may be true. I think what I want to throw out there for us to unpack and talk about is what I think I, I think there is a phenomenon going on, and I think it's happening in the lives of really, really good people. And it seems like God is just cranking up the dial, accelerating the process of 
maturity. I wanted to read Romans 8 in the message. The way uh, Peterson translates it reads like this. He says, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. And after he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. What do you hear in that? What do you hear in that passage? What stands out? To me, the beauty of that is is in my heart, is stirring as you read that, was God is at work with us, seeing something through that he initiated in us. And it's freeing because it takes the pressure off us. In other words, I don't want anybody listening to think, okay, just tell me, what do I need to do now to get through this? As much as what is God doing and how do I come alongside that? Mm. How can I be a part of that? How can that be part of my interpretation? Mm. I was taking my oldest son to a movie a few weeks ago, and God played this out for me in a really uh, wild, creative way And that we had had a disagreement over some things, and we're going to something fun, but we're driving in silence because of this disagreement we had had. And I was about to call the whole thing off, But God said, go. So I went in silence and we get to the theater, we park and to get in, we had to walk through the side alleyway. And so we're walking through the side alleyway in silence. And on the right hand side is this building four or five stories under construction, no windows, tarp blowing, the skeletal framework there. And God just said, look up, which was the opposite way of where we were headed and I look up, and it was lit in nighttime and shadows, and it, it, it was this wild imagery. But God said, that's your son. He's under construction. Mm. I'm working on him right now. Be, be okay with where he's at because he's under construction. And I acknowledge that. Wow, okay, God, yep, you're right. You're right. And then he said, and you are too. Mm. You're under construction. Both of you are this. And he said it in a really loving, not condemning way. But John, when you read that passage to me, that that is another way of saying he is girding us up. He is strengthening us. He is inviting us to become what he made us to be. And it's a messy, unfinished process, Mm -hmm. but he's doing it so that we can become fully who we're supposed to be. And if we misinterpret that, we just see it as hard and something to walk away from rather than to go, we're under construction for a really good thing. That's good. What did you hear in that passage? Oh, John, I love that passage. I was deeply encouraged. The word was, I mean, it's just encouragement. Hmm. And, and I think what I hear in the passage, particularly even today, is it is process. It is process. The goal isn't to kind of arrive or figure something out, but it's a process. And in that process, there are treasures along the way. With every step of maturity, there is some kind of upgrade of experiencing God, Mm. some upgrade of experiencing peace and joy and life in the midst of hard times rather than circumstances. And, and, And yeah, by way of story, so yesterday I was spending some time with God, grabbed a window, short window in the morning. It was very opposed. And God reminded me that he gave me a word at the beginning of the year that I sense was going to come into play this summer, and it was sim- simplify. It was simple. And I've been looking forward to that word. And, and like, it, it feels like it's naming a season ahead. Well, in these few weeks, because of some circumstances, they're probably some of the most complicated weeks of my year. And there's a lot of moving pieces. And I sat down and I just turned to God and said, God, what are you, what are you saying today? 
And he said, remember the word I had for you, simplify. And, and my knee jerk reaction was, yes, in a couple weeks from now, we're going to hit that mark and then life will get more simple. Mm. And, and I just had the sense of you saying, no, today's the day. Mm. And first I was like, my, my flesh goes, my immaturity goes, this is impossible. God, like you don't know. I just, have I you have, seen my life? This is hunker down time. Have you seen exactly. my life? Exactly. Instead, I could see that Romans 8 smile of a father saying, Son, one, I got you. Mm. I got you. Mm. Two, I'm here. Yes. And then three, what better time Mm. to go after the places in you Mm. where you have not yet become the kind of person that can live simply in me when life is complicated. So that passage reminds me it is a process, but each step, it's not heavy laden. Each step has a new treasure. And so I, I, had, a, I, I had a lightness in my step yesterday mm. that was fresh from mm. that new word. Mm. That's good. I think something creeps in. For the person who has no regard for God, for the person who has no belief in him or care what he's doing in the world, the goal is very, very simple. The goal is practical narcissism. It, it's just get your life as good as, as you can, right? And, and then whatever that means. If you've got some money, you've got some resources. If you don't, you know, you, you, you turn to other things, uh, distraction, preoccupation, whatever it is. But that's the basic fallen humanity, right? I don't care what God's doing in the world. I certainly don't care what he's doing with me. I don't even believe in him. Just get life good. But then then a person comes to Jesus and, and, you know, the doors open up and, oh, my gosh, there is a father and there is a kingdom and there's this whole world. And transformation begins, mm-hmm. right? And, and he does come to heal the brokenhearted and set the captive free. And substantive things begin to happen in our lives. And addictions begin to get broken and lifelong fears begin to be addressed. And God begins this renovation process, right? And if you hang around ministries like Ransomed Heart that are deeply committed to the restoration process, you can make some serious headway, you know. We're not the only ones doing it, but but we're committed to that particular trajectory, yes. right? But here's what creeps in. Here's what creeps in. These tools in our toolbox, like warfare, like inner healing, like hearing the voice of God, you know, breaking agreements, all these things that we have, integration, we can begin to actually think, we get back to what Alan was saying. We we, we kind of shift to, hey, this is working well. Mm. And what my life with God is about is getting life working well now with this new toolbox, with these new resources that I have. But gang, what we're putting out there on the table is, but you can actually miss Romans 8 here. It, you can miss the maturity process. Mm. It says that God stayed with them to the end gloriously. So it's wonderful gloriously completing what he had begun. And what he had begun was, is, shaping our lives into the pattern of Jesus Christ. So can I read can I read something real quick here? This is from Moving Mountains in the first chapter, and I was talking about some of the basic assumptions that we live by that help us interpret what's going on in our lives. And I begin by reading from 1 John 2, uh, quoting it. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men and women, because you have overcome the evil one. Children, fathers, young people, how beautiful. How kind of John to remind us that we are all at different places in our spiritual journeys. We're at different stages of maturing. Right? Children in the faith know the basics. They know they're forgiven. The young men and women know other things. They understand the battle. Fathers and mothers are further along still. They know God intimately. We are all underway, and we are not all in the same place. This is very gracious and realistic and quite helpful when it comes to understanding your own life or the lives of those around you. It's kind of like you with your son and the, the construction site, Alan. If you think about it, you can probably name the children, the young men and fathers and mothers in your own life. God understands where you are. As George MacDonald assured us, what father is not pleased with the first tottering attempt of his little one to walk? 
And, I say, God is absolutely committed to your growing up. Going back to McDonald, what father would be satisfied with anything but the manly step of the full-grown son or daughter? Okay? So, what what I'm trying to address here, what I go on to say is, here's the problem. Most of us don't quite share God's fervent passion for our maturity. <laughs> really, now, if you stopped 10 people at random on their way out of church next Sunday and polled them, I doubt very much that you would find one in 10 who said, oh, my first and greatest commitment this afternoon is to mature. Right? Our natural investments lie in other things, lunch, a nap, the game. <laughs> Our general comfort, including getting others to cooperate with our agenda. And yet there is no mistaking the theme in Scripture. God is committed to growing us up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Ephesians 4. Wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God. Mature and fully assured. Colossians 4. Brothers, stop thinking like children, 1 Corinthians 14. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, Hebrews 6. And in in the book, I say, wait. Knowing how to heal the sick by the laying off of hands is considered first grade stuff? I think I missed that class. But the call to grow up is very clear. And how does God provide for growing us up? What are his means? Situations that stretch us, strain us, push us beyond what we thought we could endure. Those very same circumstances that cause us to pray. The assumption is important for one simple reason. It changes your expectations. Mm. So I was on this um, personal holiday last summer. I had, a, I had a three day trip that was just mine. I jumped in my truck and I had my camping gear and my fly rods and I was going on this, you know, sort of fly fishing binge for three days and, and it was out of state. I'm driving north into Wyoming and I'm just getting away from everything. I'm getting away from my world. I'm getting away from my work. I'm getting away from my yard. You know, I'm just, this is it. This is my precious, this is the jewel in the crown of my summer. Okay. And it was totally thwarted. It was thwarted on every side. It, it was thwarted so profoundly that I did not catch a single fish. It was thwarted in so many other ways. I couldn't find a place to camp. I, I had a hard time finding food. I thought there was a grocery store in this whole town. There wasn't. And on and on. It was just thwarting. Thwarting, thwarting, thwarting. My, my truck almost gets struck on this four-wheel drive road out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, man, if I get stuck here, I mean, this is a, this is a five-hour walk back to town. And would a tow truck even come help me out here? So it was just thwarting, thwarting, thwarting. And finally, it took the second day for me to go, okay. What is going on? Like, Father, come on. Like, I'm praying, I'm battling, I'm doing all the things, I'm using the toolbox I know. And finally, I had to say, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you after in me? And here's what he said. Your hatred of me. And there was just this long, knowing silence in me. I love God. I love God. <clears throat> and I follow him very dearly and very closely and have for many years. However, chronic pain and suffering and certain unresolved issues in our personal lives lets the enemy in. It's back to that thing that that doubt about the heart of God it lets the enemy in. And, and there was just this anger in me. And, and I wouldn't have called it hatred, but he used that word to startle me, to say, you, you, have, you have a huge beef against me. Mm. And I'm like, yep, I actually do. And he said, that's what I'm after. And that's where we need to go on this trip. 
This isn't about fishing. This isn't about you having an idyllic three days. There are unaddressed things in your soul. And this is you. This is my chance to go after this with you. So that's where we're going. That's huge. <laughs> that's, <laughs> and I love how God will intervene in the most unexpected, disruptive ways. And John, I had, and Morgan, I had a situation not long ago, about a month ago, where I went to bed feeling good, normal night. And about a half hour after I went to sleep, I woke up, severe cramps and pain, was walking out of the bed, passed out, and found myself quickly in an ambulance on the way to the ER. Kelly was, you know, she didn't know what was going on. The kids didn't. I didn't. And all I could remember and think on the way to the emergency room was, I hope I'm okay. This is so bizarre. And this is going to be really expensive. And one of the things I've been wrestling with God on was financially, I'm ready for things to quit breaking and things to new expenses to keep coming. And I could feel that in the way there. Well, I go through all the tests. Everything's fine. I'm back home by 5 a.m. that morning. And I was left with, God, what in the world are you doing? Because you've just given me another expense and you weren't present. And God's interpretation, I did ask for it. And it came a day later. And basically God said, that wasn't me not being present. That was actually me doing surgery on you. I came to you to cast out hopelessness and unbelief. I did it. And he gave me the image of Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings trilogy where uh, with Theoden, he's Gandalf has the staff and he's like basically draining the toxins the and all of the um, darkness and things out of the, the King Theoden and he collapses off the throne and is back himself again. And so I share that just to say it shifted everything when I knew the interpretation when it went from God, where are you, and and actually became God saying, I'm not only present, mm-hmm. I'm doing personal surgery on you in ways you couldn't to take away the hopelessness and to take away the mistrust that had built. So, oh my so a lot of times it is that asking, what are you up to, God, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. seeing it in a whole new way because what he did – I could not have done, I'm convinced, for myself. Yes. Okay. I, 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 do, I just want to say, gang, this is our first big point. You must ask God what's going on in your life right now, what he's after. Notice how you are reacting. Mm-hmm. Notice how you are interpreting. But you, you've got to start with what's the interpretation and, and what I want to put out there and back in front of us, because it's just not a high priority for most people, is... He is always up to that Romans 8 process. He's always up to that Hebrews 6 process. He's always up to that Ephesians 4 process of maturity, maturing us, our maturation. You know he's up to that. And and rather than going, you know, quickly to this is warfare, I got to shut this down. This is attack or or uh, I'm just blowing it. I'm just an idiot. I can't handle my life. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm such a screw up. I did it. I brought this on myself. Or I'm abandoned, or I'm forsaken, you know. Pause, 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 and ask God for the interpretation. Because I think part of what's going on among the saints right now is the turning up of the dial of our maturation. John, can I ask you a question on that? Mm -hmm. So I'm tracking with you in speaking about this invitation to maturing, but can you put some more words around what does maturity look like? Because you you named that our tools and our toolbox is growing. As disciples of God through Ransom Heart, we hope that that we and others are growing in spiritual warfare and growing in how to uh, you know assess agreements and break agreements and agree with God. We're growing in the practical realities, but what I hear you saying is those tools aren't the full picture of maturing. So how, how would you describe what the maturation looks like in kind of the adult years in the kingdom? Let me first off say... It's always very personal. Mm-hmm. 
It's very, very intimate. Your discipleship process is immensely personalized. It's customized by God. It's tailored to your age. It's tailored to your, you know, your, your historic life with Christ so far. It's tailored to what you do know and don't know. It's tailored to your story. It's tailored to your brokenness. It's tailored to your sin. So I, I have to say that first because that's why asking God what are you after? Yes. What are we working on is so important because in any person's life, it's it's very, very different. I actually have a number of things I want to say. So this is going to go into two podcasts here. But let me conclude this week's by saying it is always a deeper surrender. It is always a, a, a more thorough giving up of our life. And, and it's, it's, that's very counterintuitive because life with God is wonderful. And a deeper life with Christ and the more restoration he brings, as you become more wholehearted, your life does get better. It does. Your marriage and your relationships can, can improve. Your parenting can improve. Your finances can improve because God is working deeply in your world and all that. However, However, in the adult years, quote unquote, of the Christian life, two things are going on. One is we really are relinquishing that fundamental human commitment to good life. And so there's there's just deeper and deeper levels of surrender and particularly surrender of the self life. And I'll say more about that next time. The second thing is no one is making the connection between their coming life and this life. And yet most of what God is up to in your life right now, particularly in the maturing years, has everything to do with your coming life. And therefore, if that's just not a part of your framework, if that's just not a part of, you just don't even think like that, well, then of course you're not going to understand what the is going on right now in your life, right? You're, you're going to continue to try and revert to the old life. It's just a very, very tangible example. So, you know, I am a fisherman and it is summer. And so I went out again this year. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> and I went out with a, a dear friend of mine who was also very mature in the Christian life and way down the field and tons and tons of years with God. And we went and floated the Green River in Utah for a couple of days together. And, and normally, normally it it is scandalous fishing. It's tuna boat. I mean, you, you know, you'll catch 30, 40, you know, 70 fish in a day. And the first day he only caught one. And the second day I only caught one. And I knew what God was doing it, because it, it it's that no life really is about, I'll do what, I'll do what you want. I'll, I'll obey, I'll serve, I'll fight, I'll endure, but then I get my life back. Mm. But then I get my, I get my little world, like whatever your little your world. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever your little world is, you know, I get my, I get my quiet, I get my solitude. I get my trip to, you know, the, the Carolina coast. I get my, whatever it is for you without the recognition that now actually your life now is so, so largely shaped about your coming life. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's just a hugely mature topic that we very rarely get to talk about and probably need to address here. So let me bring this in for a landing this week by saying just simply two things. We are in our own lives and we are making the observation in the lives of a lot of really good people. And, and the reason I'm saying really good people is because they're not intentionally blowing up their own life. Okay. People who are trying to live well, people who are trying to love well, okay, walk well, something's going on. Something's going on, it, it, you know, whether it's finances or health or relationships or mission or work or identity or just some something's going on. And I'm watching people interpret it without this major category. I think what's going on is because of the lateness of the hour, I think God is turning up the dial on maturity and on our maturation. I think he is actually accelerating the process. If you'll let that in and let that be, you know, a very possible interpretation, it is actually going to be very freeing 
and very encouraging to you. And, and, and we can actually help you with that. We can, and so next week we'll come back with, so if that is true, mm-hmm. if you go to God and he says, oh yeah, that's what we're doing. What do you do with that? Then we'll, we'll come back and, and share some thoughts on that next time. So you've been listening to the Ransomed Heart podcast with Alan Arnold, Morgan Snyder, John Eldridge, talking about what do we do when we feel this going on in our world? What might be happening if God is turning up the dial of maturity in your own life? So hope you come back next time for part two.